Okay, thanks everyone and thanks for your patience as we put another chair on the stage. Uh, really delighted to see all of you here for day two and really excited to get started on a deeper dive into one of these critical parts that Brad was talking about. I'm David Koek, I'm the Chief Scientist of Ocean Visions and I'm really happy to be chairing this part of the track where we're going to take a deep dive into looking at what can be done to preserve the structure and function of coral reefs in the inevitably warming and acidifying climate that we've locked ourselves into. So hopefully you all know about the threats that are facing coral reefs, and in particular the effects of marine heat waves on large-scale coral bleaching and disruption of ecological dynamics. I think this diagram from the IPCC report should look familiar to many of you. And this really highlights the existential threat that reefs face in a warming world of 1.5 degree, which you can see as the left circle on that plot, much less the circle that's on the right side of that plot, which is the pathway that we're on if we continue our business as usual scenarios. So we're looking at near total extinction of coral reefs. And given this existential threat, and I think this is actually the correct use of that word, existential threat, it begs the question about can we do anything to preserve reefs? Can we use ingenuity, innovation, science, engineering, research and development to identify, test, and scale viable solutions to preserve the structure and function of coral reefs? So here I'm showing a schematic, I think this got shown yesterday, but this is from the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program in Australia that's looking at all of the physical and biological pathways that can be used to preserve the structure and function of coral reefs. And so that's really the topic of today's talk, or the topic of today's session. What can be done to investigate, identify, and scale viable solutions for helping to preserve the structure and function of coral reefs? We have three great talks today. Um, so we're going to hear from each of our th three speakers. We have Andrea, Gattol Andrea Grattoli from Ohio State University. We have Diane Thompson from the University of Arizona. And we have Peng Zhang joining us virtually from the Southern University of Science and Technology. Each of these esteemed scholars is going to speak for about eight minutes, and then we're going to have a panel discussion where we identify some of the common challenges and opportunities around um, innovations to scale coral reefs. So without further ado, let me turn over the stage to Andrea, who's going to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really want to talk to you today about a new technology. This is moving into the technology space is a new thing for me and my group. And I'm going to talk about Uzella. That's the name of our thing. And it's a feeding technology for, to enhance coral restoration and conservation and improve survivorship and coral growth. And there's a lot of people involved in this project that are listed here today. When we think of a coral, we think of something like this. But when we zoom in, we see that it is made up of polyps that are all interconnected by a single tissue layer. And corals are mixotrophic. That means they get food two ways. They eat zooplankton and particulate organic matter that they capture with their tentacles and put into their mouths. And they also have endosymbiotic algae in their tissues. These are single-celled algae that photosynthesize far in excess of their own metabolic needs and translocate the vast majority of those sugars to the coral host. In this way, corals get food two ways. <clears throat> when coral are healthy and they have their full complement of endosymbiotic algae, they're nice and brown like this picture of a coral reef in Hawaii. But when seawater temperatures increase by as little as 1 to 2 degrees Celsius for as little as 10 days, they become stressed, they lose their endosymbiotic algae, and we see through the clear gelatinous tissue of the white skeleton underneath, hence the term bleaching. Under these conditions, there is low or no photosynthesis. So that whole way of getting food is missing, and the corals are in a starvation mode. This is very stressful. It increases risks to the corals for diseases, so they've reduced coral health, and it increases risks for mortality. However, there are some coral that have higher feeding rates to begin with, or have the capacity to dramatically increase feeding rates in response to stress. And these corals tend to have lower mortality rates and, rec 
or recover and or recover more quickly from bleaching. So we asked ourselves, can we increase feeding in corals to minimize mortality following bleaching and improve growth on restored reefs? And to do this, we developed Uzella, the underwater zooplankton enhancement light array. And I brought one with me today. This is Uzella. It is a uh, autonomous underwater um, light device. It is self-powered and it is uh, programmable. And if anybody wants to know more about the device itself, happy to talk about it. My graduate student, Shannon, is here. She's the one who actually glues them all together. <clears throat> but Uzella, uh, we program it to go on at night, and it acts to concentrate the local abundance of zooplankton for coral. And we are in the process of testing Uzella, and we are asking three questions or three hypotheses. Does Uzella enhance feeding in corals? Does it enhance coral growth? And does it reduce mortality following bleaching? And you can see in this photo here, um, corals that we bleached and controls, ones that we didn't bleached, that are positioned on this rack around Uzella lights. They hang through that rack. And in the foreground, these are ones with the lights and they turn on at, at night for one hour to locally concentrate zooplankton and increase the opportunity for feeding. And in the background is another rack and that's a control. So we have some without lights. And you can just see here on the left-hand side is um, from the dock, the floating platform beneath, there are several racks, some with Uzella and some without. And then on the right-hand side, a picture of the setup at night when the lights are on. I have a short video as well. To Sorry. And there's another video, but maybe it doesn't need audio. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can turn that off. Um, and this is just the lights at night. And, a and you'll see little particles. It's actually the zooplankton swimming around going to the light. Uh, but it's a little grainy because it's at night and it's in the dark. Thank you for turning that audio off. And so you see the particles. Those are actually zooplankton. And they're attracted to the light in the same way that moths are attracted to a flame. So we locally enhance. We leverage existing zooplankton in the environment. We're not adding zooplankton. We're just concentrating them locally for a short period of time to enhance feeding opportunities. So we did this um, for 10 days. And then we harvested one third of the corals and measured their feeding rates. And this is showing the zooplankton uh, captured so that we dissected out of the guts of the corals. The pink ones are corals <coughs> excuse me, that were bleached. And the blue bars are feeding rates for corals that were non-bleached or the controls. And if they had uzella or the concentrated light from the lights, the bar is dark pink or dark blue. And what is painfully, or I shouldn't say painfully, what is clearly obvious is that those that had Uzella had extremely high feeding rates compared to those without. And we did this in Montipra capitata and Parietes compressa. And in both cases, we see this dramatic enhanced feeding in the corals that have uh, Uzella. And in addition with um, Parietes compressa, there's a suggestion that the um, Bleached corals might have even had higher feeding rates than the non-bleached in response to Uzella. After 45 days, we harvested another third of the corals that were out there and did the same thing. And again, that pattern of enhanced feeding in the presence of the light persisted in Montepera capitata. And this work is part of my PhD student, Shannon Dixon's PhD. And so um, she and I are both happy to talk to you more about the actual data. Unfortunately, Parietes compressa got infected by a parasitic nudibranch between day 40, 10 and 45 and died. So we don't have data for that beyond 45 days. But we are continuing this. The, the last third of the corals are still out there. And in June, we go back to assess again after six months. So what we've been able to demonstrate so far is that Uzella does enhance coral feeding and it can be deployed on reefs. <coughs> it can be deployed on reefs. We are in the process of quantifying how it affects growth and after six months we'll be able to assess um, mortality gains or, or not um, in the presence of Uzella. So how can we use Uzella? Well, we are currently, it is being funded um, to support a DOD project, the DARPA project, to build a living, sustainable 
reef to protect coastlines from sea level rise, wave energy, and it has to be able to withstand a plus two degree warming, which is where Uzella comes in. And so we will be deploying our technology on the reef. It, it will be this design um, next summer. We also could envision applications for coral nurseries and restored sites in order to protect them from bleaching events. We can forecast these coming several uh, weeks to months out knowing and you might want to invest in protecting that asset by using Uzella. There's also potential applications for things like red coral farming. Right now they're used in the jewelry industry and over harvested in the wild, but um, there's the potential that you could farm them if you could increase their growth rates and Uzella could potentially do that. You could also envision other scenarios, any organism, even deep corals, uh, giant clams, anything that requires zooplankton in their diet, Uzella could concentrate those zooplankton and enhance um, feeding potential. This particular technology is a band-aid solution. Corals are beyond the tipping point. We are working from behind at this point. We need to continue to slow climate change, improve local conditions like pollution and overfishing, while simultaneously actively restoring and protecting these, these um, ecosystems and Uzella is one part of that solution. Thank you so much. Hello. All right, it's my pleasure to continue this theme and as the Director of Marine Research at the Biosphere to talk to you about the work that we're doing in this really unique mesocosm to scale up solutions for coral reef remediation and restoration to really build the resilient reefs worldwide that Andrea was just talking about. So before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that this is the work of a diverse team of collaborators all over the world, including our amazing Biosphere 2 team shown here. So over decades, we have learned what I call the key building blocks of coral reef resilience. And this is from uh, the microbes that live associated with coral tissues, including the types of symbionts that they harbor all the way out to the regional and global scale um, patterns of stress and their severity. But the community now recognizes, as Andrea just ended on, the urgent need to move from understanding, sorry, understanding these processes, it's just that was for emphasis, uh, to moving towards solutions. So applying this knowledge and testing this knowledge at scale, which is where the Biosphere 2 comes in. But first, the work of, again, an amazing collaborative network across the world has developed a number of innovative solutions for reef resilience. A couple of quick examples is that through work like my own in paleoceanography, we can core corals, both living and fossil, like the one shown here on the right, and see examples of natural resilience in corals, where corals have died and regrown following stress. So for example, on the left-hand side, I show a core from the Galapagos Islands that experienced mortality during the 1982-83 El Nino event, and then subsequently regrew about three years later. Of course, the problem has become that these heat stress events are now yearly in many places on Earth, and so the corals do not have sufficient time to recover. Fortunately, we also know from this work that history does shape the future response. So as an example shown on the upper left, uh, we've seen that in places like the Galapagos that experience strong and frequent heat stress, that they're more likely than expected to experience lower levels of bleaching when these events reoccur. So if we look at these regions, subsequent work has actually shown that the level of thermal stress required to create bleaching is as much as five times higher in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. 
So knowledge like this has been used to develop one of our innovative solutions, which is to actually stress hardened corals before reintroducing them to the wild in restoration um, applications to then um, re, uh, increase their resistance to bleaching. Another example of a really innovative solution is to actually capitalize on our understanding of the coral associated microbiome, in particular isolate colonies um, that have uh, specific physiological um, advantages that they impart on the symbiosis, and then apply them back to the coral to then enhance, uh, again, the coral physiological response to things like thermal stress. So our colleagues have done this work and shown that, for example, when we apply what are called the beneficial microbial consortia to corals during an experimental thermal stress, that these corals experience lower levels of bleaching and mortality than a placebo experiment. So again, these are really promising examples, but the community recognizes a need to be able to scale up and test these solutions before they're applied in the wild and understand any uh, potential downstream consequences at ecosystem scale. So that's where the Biosphere 2 comes in. And as a community, again, we're using this test bed to understand how do we best build resilient reefs of the future. So we can capitalize on what I like to call the Goldilocks of scale and control that the Biosphere 2 provides. So it's a 2.6 million liter tank that can be very precisely manipulated to simulate both future stress as well as variability that we expect under continued ocean warming and acidification. And we can use this test bed to then test these solutions and understand how we can then build what we call resilient reefs, which are those that we're gonna maintain the critical structure and function that we need of our coral reefs worldwide. So the Biosphere 2 is this Goldilocks between these small scale experiments that we've understood a lot of these processes and this sort of uncontrolled natural environment. Uh, really bridging as shown here in this plot from the micrometer scale on the Y axis all the way out to the kilometer scale and uh, from seconds to now decades that the system has been um, self-sustained really allowing us uh, in that blue box to really cover up ecosystem processes all the way up to the community scale. And we know from uh, you know, decades of work that this, these scales are really critical for policy relevant science. And so this is a great review paper and I have little blue check marks to highlight that all of these relevant scales for policy science um, are, are sort of applied at the biosphere too. So for those not familiar with the Biosphere 2, I wanna briefly show you a cross section of what the system looks like here on the bottom, the ba bathymetric map. It was built to reproduce a Caribbean coral reef barrier reef ecosystem. So you have on the far right hand side, the four reef environment that's about seven meters deep in the system sloping up to a reef crust and a diverse back reef lagoon. We're in the final phase of re-engineering the system to 2020s technology, including um, supplementing lighting over the reef, as well as introducing these yellow things here in the bottom, which are flow canyons to be able to reproduce uh, reef scale turbulence. So I don't have time to go into the details today. I encourage you to come find me after the talk if you're interested, but we've had a number of scoping workshops over a number of years with the reef community to identify the types of questions that can be uniquely addressed with this system. So I hope you were able to catch our posters yesterday that summarized the results of phase one, where we focused on how to best rejuvenate and, and remediate um, degraded coral reefs, like the ones we expect in the future up at the top right. Um, and we're rapidly moving into phase two, where we're again gonna apply these innovative solutions, testing them at scale to see if we can engineer a resilient reef. So for example, we've already isolated a number of BMCs, these beneficial microorganisms consortia, um, that have unique properties related to coral calcification and that we plan on testing at the biosphere too. Secondly, we have a number of stress hardening experiments planned uh, to address key open questions, such as how long does this resistance persist? 
And can it be passed down to generations? And will it really work under not just today's ocean change, but expected future ocean change? And importantly, without going into the details on that table, what are the mechanistic basis, both on the molecular level as well as the geochemical level, uh, of, these, um, of, of this response? And finally, in the last phase, of course, we're going to look at these solutions under not just today's conditions, like I said, but under future multi-stress, both warming and acidification. Uh, and with that, I just want to end by saying again, I'm representing as the director a large team of international brilliant coral reef collaborators who have with me developed this unique vision, including the leg legendary late Ruth Gates, who really saw the value of the Biosphere 2 as this test bed and was really instrumental in getting this project jump started. And with that, I would like to end by just uh, encouraging you to reach out to me after the panel if you're interested in getting uh, involved. So, Peng, I think you're. Can you hear the voice now? That's great. Thanks. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great. So, uh, in the next few minutes, I I'd like to introduce a bit our efforts on building an integrated system for coral reef monitoring and uh, research uh, restorations. So, this is a collaboration research that has been implemented by our colleagues at uh, Southern University of Science and Technology, Health, and uh, Guangxi University. So as we know, the, the, the coral reef has been under great uh, threats these days. So we, we, the first thing we need to do is to develop a system that can monitor the coral reefs at different scales. So at the beginning, we're talking about the uh, uh, airborne systems. Usually, they are mounted with a multi-spectrum sensors to detect, uh, for instance, the benthic types, the uh, percentage coverage, the bathymetries, and coastal circulations. And if we zoom out to the satellite, uh, usually we have the multi-spectrum sensors uh, embodied, so they can get no, more information on the general distribution of uh, coral reefs, the geomorphologies, and the large-scale coral bleaching tendencies. But what if we want to know more details of the corals on their species, such as their health conditions, the species evolutions and distributions. And the current approach still need to uh, dive into the waters and uh, collect the samples, send the sample back to the lab and get their DNA tested. So is there any better approach to, to do this? So for here, I'd like to introduce what we have developed is a system to collect the multi-spectrum characteristics of different types and species of the corals, based on which we can build an optical coral dictionary so how, how this work? While we dive into the water, we'll bring this instrument. And by comparing to the whiteboard reference, we can get useful optical hyperspectral information of the corals corresponding to the collected samples. So at, at this stage, while building this correspondence, we still need to collect the samples and are trying to find the links between them. And then we can estimate the parameters and define a differentiable algorithm to distinguish corals for different families genera and, and species. So once we have this dictionary, we no longer need to take the samples again. Later on, if we move to another region, we just need to mount the sensors maybe under the boat or in the ROV, then we can carry out the in-situ survey in a quite sufficient uh, approach. So as for the restorations, uh, one promising method for restoring the core reef is to use the beneficial microorganisms as the probiotics. This is an uh, image shown, shared by our colleagues at KAUST, whose team has uh, selected different marine microorganisms for coral reef restoration. And at the same time, another effort is to uh, print the scaffold of the houses of coral reefs. Uh, with this, uh, we are building the houses for the corals and their marine microorganisms to throw on. So the shape and the sizes for the printed unit are developed through the uh, direct observation of the natural coral skeletons 
and in combining uh, with the uh, digital competition techniques. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties with Peng, so um, maybe we'll get started with some questions to Andrea and, and Diane. There was just so much food for thought in each of their talks, and um, I guess I, I want to start with you, Andrea. You know, when you, you had all of these really amazing results and insights about a specific technology, and I just want to ask, you know, what do you see as the biggest prior, priorities now at both a at both the level of an individual technology and the level of the entire system for advancing critical R&D to support coral reef resilience? At the individual technology level, and I can only speak to mine, is um, trying to figure out that bridge from scientific demonstration of, of uh, proof of concept to manufacturing and making that more commercially available I'm at a Midwestern university, and so if anybody out, and they're not very helpful in this space, so if anybody out there is looking to invest in Uzella and help me get it to commercialization, that's like a rate limiting step to R&D at this point, so it can be implemented and used in all these potential applications. Um, the other limitation is permitting. So when we do these experiments, um, we are, we were limited in where we can deploy it, how we can implement it, how long we can put it on the reef, and this really limits the capacity we have for the scale at which we can test and, this, and um, the sort of the number of things that we can do and the number of manipulations we can do to test the instrument. And so these are our critical issues. And then the last is urgency. You know, when you talk about tipping points, coral reefs are past, they've tipped. So we, the urgency factor is right in our face right now. I want to highlight something that Andrea did right there at the beginning, which is that call for help, that request for help. You know, that's what we're looking for here. So when you're meeting people at this conference, when you're talking with people, make sure you let them know what you need and vice versa, and that's how we build connections. Diane, same question to you. You know, what are what do you see as the biggest priorities at the level of individual technologies and systems level change? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think the, the keys are uh, the scalability um, and the testing. And, and so for like Uzella and a lot of these solutions, it's a no brainer to just employ, deploy as quickly as possible. For some of the more complicated solutions, like things like assisted evolution, um, we need to be really mindful about how we're, how we're doing this, right? And, and yet move as quickly as possible. And so I think, uh, again, in, in terms of call to action, really supporting both the, the, the sort of critical on the ground action as quickly as possible, as well as um, the funding, which is even harder sometimes for the scalability of these, as, as Andrea alluded to, getting the, the technology from the test phase to market as well as um, you know, the funding for the long-term monitoring of the solutions that are potentially extremely transformative, but also potentially risky. Um, so this is where, I, again, I think the Biosphere 2 offers a really unique intermediate test bed for those types of technologies, and that's what we hope to serve for the community. I think that was a great, um uh, segue into my next question, and I'll come back to you to start, Diane. Can you talk a little bit about the concerns of unintended consequences, and, uh, and also the concerns perhaps about not pursuing some of these technologies as well? Yeah, it's a great question because they're both equally concerning. So obviously the cost of inaction is, is the greatest cost at this point. Andrea has said that already. I want to emphasize that point. And so, again, the coral reef community is on board for these interventions. We know it is desperately needed. Um, and I will say that we are um, taking those potential consequences uh, of, of sort of any unintended um, uh, impacts of these interventions very seriously as community. And again, this is why um, I'm just thrilled at, at the community's excitement over the Biosphere 2 and its role to play in that, in that space. And so, again, I think it's, it's this cost-benefit risk analysis that we all must do in this in solution space that we're all here in for various technologies 
is to identify you know how risky they are and and be mindful about their deployment and so certain types of solutions i think a great example with andrea's technology have relatively low risk right whereas there's other things like pro probiotics, I think are one of the most promising solutions. But I think there's a lot of open questions about um, how much that transmission is actually carried from colony to colony, how much it impacts the microbial community of the reef as a whole. And those are the types of tests that are being done all over the world, um, but need to be done at scale. And so, um, I think it's really, again, just comes down to the type of technology and us being mindful as a community to move as quickly as possible, and but yet as carefully as possible. And again, I think the Biosphere 2 plays a critical role in that. I agree with all of that. There's a great um, a conversation, it's a, it's a YouTube thing that came out years ago about climate change, and it talks about the risk of doing nothing. And for coral reefs, we are at that point. So the risk of doing nothing is greater than the risk of doing something, um, knowing that we don't always a priori know exactly how it will turn out. And I'm not talking about reefs that are relatively healthy. Those you would, you would not wanna touch. They're already doing fine, right? It's the reefs that are so degraded that there's so little left, that there's no reproductive viability where you have nothing to lose that's where you can be more aggressive and take those risks because the risk of doing nothing means more coastal erosion, greater storm damage, loss of food resources for people, loss of income due to tourism and the other and fisheries, things that reefs support that we are losing. And so that cost benefit um, in many cases is the, the risk of doing nothing is worse than, than intervening. Final question to both of you. What's your advice for early career professionals here who are looking to make a difference and improve the health and trajectories of our oceans and our climate? To just keep put one foot in front of the other <laughs> and to not be afraid to talk about your research. I think the biggest thing for early career is being nervous about um, sharing broadly, when I was a graduate student, my PhD advisor told me the science speak for itself, you're not allowed to have an opinion and inject into a policy space. And that is completely false. That is not the world we live in, where you need to openly, aggressively, and constantly share your findings to, to put that science into the broader discussion and it becomes part of silence, uh, policy and decision making, waiting for research findings to trickle up is, is not practical in today's world. So never turning down an interview, never turning down an opportunity to guest lecture, especially public lectures, always taking those calls from middle school students and high school students who are interested in coral reefs. Like I do those things, they take time, but that is a critical piece to making your science not just about the finding you have, but making it count more, making it reach a broader audience, letting it have greater impact. That's a great answer, hard to follow. So I would add a couple of things, agree with everything Andrea said. Um, and I would add that, you know, I think Raquel Piaxoto, for those in the room who know her, who developed, you know, was one of the key developers of this probiotic solution that a lot of us are talking about. Um, is just such an innovator and such a you know firecracker and she was told at the beginning right this isn't going to work and it's too risky and yada 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 right and now at icrs there's multiple uh, sorry international coral reef symposium there's multiple sessions now in probiotics because they're so promising so don't be afraid to do the transformative risky you know thing even when everybody's saying you're crazy because you're, that means you're onto something nine times out of ten. Um, and so I, I think we really need people like Raquel who are not afraid to, to, to push against the status quo. I think there's many examples like that in all of our communities. And so just don't be afraid to be different. Um, and I'd say related to that too, we just need more um, diversity in this space. So also don't be afraid 
um, to be different, um, to bring your unique ideas, your unique self to the table because this is such a challenging problem that we're only gonna solve it if all hands are on deck. Um, and so we really do need to be diversifying our space and it's still too white, it's still too male. And so again, I would, I would think about this broadly and, and if you're feeling like on the outside of the community, um, yeah, please come on in um, uh, and we need you. I will add that I, like Raquel, my PhD advisor and my committee thought it was hilarious I wanted to measure coral feeding when I was a PhD student, because I've been thinking about coral feeding since then. And the, the paradigm, or the, the thinking at the time was that it was ancillary. It wasn't part of real nutrition. It was just to get so, a few vitamins and minerals on the side. And, and all that and time you were onto something and you had <laughs> too much pushback again. Pushback, pushback. But Paul Joaquil literally laughed out loud. Not in a bad way. He's like, go for it. That's hilarious. That's great. And, and you know, yeah. then it turned into a nature paper. There you go. Let's take a moment to thank our three speakers. And now we're gonna make the transition from the tropics to the poles. I'm gonna turn it back to Brad, who's gonna take us into the next session of this track, which is dedicated to cryosphere preservation.